All right. We're starting a new book tonight. <clears throat> starting a new series, if you will. So, if you have your Bibles, turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. And I will just say, we will eventually go through the whole book, but it will not be from front to back of the book. So there will be different topics that we will be talking about, and we will pull different sections of this book that pertain to these specific topics. So we're going to bounce around a little bit in the book as we go through, but we will eventually cover all of it. So if we if we get to bouncing around and get confused, just let me know and I'll I'll slow down. But uh what are we here for? Like on this earth? We we hear that question asked a lot, like, what's the meaning of life? What are we here for? We're here to reflect God's image. We're here to do the work that he gave us to do and reflect his image as our calling. So we do that through our calling. Or a simpler way of saying that is our job that he gives us. And being unified in that process makes things go so much easier. And we're going to look at that. <clears throat> Well, we're going to look at an example of that out of Nehemiah here. But first, I want to make a pit stop by Genesis 11, verse 6. And it says, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So in this passage... This was the story of the Tower of Babel. So this is when all the unbelievers were coming together to build a tower up to the heavens. God ended up having to scatter them because he said, now there's nothing that will be impossible for them because they were unified in their mission. If unified unbelievers are that strong, how strong can unified believers be? So, God will call us both individually and collectively. And we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll see an example of that. So, we'll get started here in chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twelfth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenants and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept your commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell by your great power. 
They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. So one thing we see here is Nehemiah is getting the news of the current state or shape of Jerusalem. It's in pieces, walls broken down, temples destroyed, all this. He's very grieved. One thing we see him say here in verse 11, it says, give success to your servant today. He's asking for God's blessing. He's asking for success. He already knows, he feels this burden to go back to Jerusalem and to start fixing and getting things back ready. And he's asking for success in that. If we will jump over real quick to chapter 5, we'll see another situation here. So this is verses 1 through 13. Now at this point, Nehemiah has already made it back to Jerusalem. But it says, Now there arose a great outcry of the people, and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our field and our vineyard. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself and brought charges against the nobles and the officials, I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God, to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be, he be shaken out and empty. And all of the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. So this section in chapter 5, we see another example of where something was going wrong. Nehemiah felt burdened. His burden in this chapter came as an oppression. The people of of mm, of Israel were being oppressed. They were exacting interest on their brothers, all this good stuff, and they shouldn't have been. It upset Nehemiah greatly. He called them out on it. What are you doing? His calling, his job, 
came to him as that burden, as that anger of what was going on. We can also see uh, in Ezra, because Ezra parallels Nehemiah. They both tell the story of Jerusalem being rebuilt. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, it says, Now after this, in the region of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief of priests. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the, the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So God called Ezra up from Babylonia to be the priest while everybody else was making their way in and all this. He was skilled in the law. He was a scribe. So just him having the ability to get that knowledge and be trained that way in Babylonia is a miracle from God. Because everybody was kind of scattered. All the all the actual documents were still, still back, back in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So, so being taught that over in Babylonia, he was being helped by God. But he was called from over there to come back and help rebuild as well. So we see where Nehemiah, he was burdened to come back and help with Jerusalem. We see where he got angry to help with all the poor people in Jerusalem from being oppressed. Some other ways that God can call us to do something, he can speak directly to us. And we can see that with folks like Noah, Abraham, Moses, Samuel. I mean, there, there's a lot of, of <clears throat> examples of that in here. He can speak to us through dreams and visions like he did with Daniel, Isaiah, and Paul. There are, of course, other examples. Something, another way that a lot of people overlook is providence. His sovereign power to make things happen and move stuff around. Ruth is a very good example of that. Esther is another good example. Things just fell in place for them. Because in the in the opening chapter of Ruth, she gives her life to the Lord. She tells Naomi, your God is my God and your people are my people. So she turns her life over to God and moves back to Jerusalem with Naomi and just happened to be in the right field at the right time to meet Boaz. That's not a coincidence. The Lord orchestrated that. That is an example of his providence. And even if the Lord doesn't speak directly to us and say, you will go do this, whether audibly, in a dream, vision, whatever the case is, the Bible is our calling. There are a lot of instructions in here that he wants us to do. But once God shows us our calling, once we get that, it's very important that we start to pray and we make plans. And we, we see that in Nehemiah. So he started making plans after he asked the Lord for direction. So if we turn back over to Nehemiah chapter 2. It says, 
In the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of, of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. So we see he's starting to make plans. He asked the king for leave because he couldn't just leave without the king's permission. King granted him leave. He asked for papers to pass through all the different provinces safely without being harassed. The king gave it to him. He asked for lumber from the king's force. He gave it to him. So with these plans... He's he's getting going. He's he's headed that way. And if we turn back to chapter five in verses fourteen through nineteen, it says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth year to the thirty second year of Artaxerxes the king, twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also preserved in the work on this, persevered, excuse me, I also persevered in the work on this wall and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day, one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and even ten, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance for the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. So even here, as we look at this example, he didn't take the food allowances for the governor which he could have rightly done since he was the governor, but he chose not to. He chose to give it back to the people. He chose instead to pay for all of it himself and to invite more people over. But these were plans that he was making to help all the other people of Israel. So, that is one thing that we see in both examples here. God provided everything Nehemiah needed in vast abundance. 
So some questions that we can ask ourselves to help us figure out, you know, is God really want to do to do this? Maybe it's just something I've kind of cooked up in my head that I want to do. But some questions that we can ask ourselves. What does the Bible say? If it doesn't line up with the Bible, then it's not from God. So, let's say someone is being called to preach. But for some reason, the voice they're hearing is telling them to preach from the Quran and Mary Ted. Like, that's not God. You're, you're not listening to the right spirit there. Another question is, what did you hear in your listening prayers? So, John ten twenty seven, Jesus says, His sheep hear His voice, and He knows Him, and they follow Him. So, we know the Lord's voice. What did we hear from Him? If you are willing to listen... God is willing to speak. What does your wise counsel say? We don't always hear correctly. But God always speaks clearly. So maybe we take what we hear and we go to our wise counsel. Tell them what we heard. Let them pray about it. See what they say. What does rightful authority say? So Romans 13, 12. God puts people in positions of authority. And he also does this with divine beings in heaven. So there's, there's different levels. And this is how heaven and everything will be run for eternity. We have those levels of authority here on earth. So in a church, it starts with the elders and the head pastor and then it steps down to junior leadership and then to the congregation so what does rightful authority say what does providence say sometimes we're not sure God's being quiet but doors just keep miraculously opening for you to just go this way and there's really no other way to go because all the other doors just keep shutting so what does providence say what does your conscience say romans 2 verses 14 and 15 paul talks about our conscience and says that everyone has a conscience that's how God made every one of us. We don't all have the Holy Spirit, though. So if we have our conscience and the Holy Spirit, we're a step ahead of a lot of people. Your conscience, just another note on this, your conscience is, a lot of people will describe it as just a gut feeling. Like, I'm just not quite, feeling right about that whatever that is some people say well it's it, it's something i just feel in my spirit that's our conscience talking to us that's our conscience telling us be weary of that or it could be saying hey that's good you need to go that way it could be either way but once you know god's will for your life his plan for you you can live with a with a pure conscience. And if we are fulfilling our calling, God will provide us with everything that we need. And we see this in Nehemiah very clearly because being cupbearer to the king was a very high position. And it's not something that the king would just send that person off because the king really had to trust that person they had to be way up there ranking with the king because that person can take out the king real easy if he wanted to so everything that nehemiah needed was provided for 
Everything he prayed for was provided for. We also see this in Ezra. Like I said earlier, Ezra parallels Nehemiah because they're both going back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and the temple and all this. So in Ezra 7, verses 6 and 9, it says, This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given and the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So everything Ezra asked, the king gave it to him. Verse 9 says, For on the first day of the first month he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. Four months. It took four months to make that journey. And it was roughly 900 miles. So it doesn't sound like too bad. If you did the math, you average out to about five or six miles a day. But if you look in Ezra, that group of people that came with him, it was a very large group of people that came with Ezra. Inside that group, it only names the heads of the house. But you can pretty well bet that there was some older folks there. There were some young kids. The group was. And there's no, really no telling just how big the group was. Because it doesn't list all the people that were in it, just the heads of houses and the first few sons. But it was a very large group that made it 900 miles in four months with no problems. That's definitely God at work helping them to get through there. And we also see in Isaiah 40, verses 29 and 30 through 31, it says, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary. And young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Everything we need, he will provide it as long as we're doing the work that he wants us to do. One of the coolest examples that I can think of is Elijah. When it was time for the rains to come back and Elijah prayed and here they come, the clouds growing. He sends his servant to tell Ahab, you need to get out of there. The rains are coming. It's going to flood. Ahab takes off. Elijah beats him there. Elijah outran a horse because and it said the hand of the Lord was on him. That is awesome. So the Holy Spirit, God, will help us with our calling, no matter what it is, as long as it's his calling and not some, some other. And an important note that I've got here, if we aren't doing what God wants us to do, so we're, we're not following God, he will not provide the things that we need. And it will be much harder for us to get the things done than if it was someone doing those things that God is calling them to do them. So if someone is saying that they're, and I'm just going to say called to preach and they get up here, it's going to be a lot harder for them to get through all of this and to explain God's word and to follow what he wants than someone who is called to do it. And Nehemiah also took steps to confirm his calling as, as we should. So the steps that we see back in chapter 1 
when he's confirming the what I would call the big calling to go back and to lead the rebuilding project. As we read through chapter 1, we see that he fasts and prays for God's guidance. We should too. He repents of any sins that are standing in the way. We saw that he not only repented of his sins, but for all the sins of all the people in Israel. As you roll into chapter 2, it says, he believed and acted upon God's promises. So, as the Lord told him, because he right before chapter 2, he asked, give success to your servant today. So, as he rolled into chapter 2, the king was talking to him and he prayed again, and God gave him that success. He acted upon those promises. Ask humbly for doors to be open that only God can open. Right there when he was praying for the, when the king asked him and he prayed really quick, Lord, please let me have the right words because if I say the wrong words to the king, you know, he's liable to do away with me. That's the, the way the king receives that. Only God can, can manipulate that. Boldly act when the time is right. So over in chapter 5, we see that he acts boldly when he sees and hears that people are putting the interest on the loans. He acts boldly in getting the nobles together and saying, this has got to stop. Give thanks when God provides at the end of the section we read in chapter 5, he gave thanks to the Lord for providing everything that he did. So in Second Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, it says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way... There will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, we need to confirm our calling. We can use the same questions that were asked earlier. And maybe you're thinking, the Lord hasn't spoken to me. I haven't heard anything. I've been doing my listening prayers. I've salt wise counsel i've done all of this and it's just crickets first question were you truly listening if you remember the story of elijah when he was in the cave it said god's voice came to him as a still small voice sometimes most of the time really God speaks very softly because he wants us to be tuned in and listening and paying attention to him and not all the distractions that are in this world. In Romans 12, verses 4 through 8, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortion, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. So Paul is telling us here that we all get a job because these are all job titles. We're all going to get different ones. And we all will be a part of the body in some way, shape, or form, the body of Christ. And I know this is going to be a weird question right in the middle of everything, but 
can everybody swim? Okay. Because it's, it's said that God's Word, the Bible, is shallow enough that babies can swim, but it's deep enough that you can drown a giraffe. And we're about to jump in the deep end here. So in Romans 1, verses 1 through 7, the opening greeting of Romans, it's all one sentence. But it had to be broken up into seven verses because there's so much that Paul packed into there. So I want to look at the end of verse 4 through verse 6. It says, at the end of verse 4, it says, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So we're all called. And he says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom. So all of this comes through Jesus. Jesus gives us our grace he says we have received grace now this grace is grace for our salvation it's grace for our forgiveness it's grace for anything else that he provides for us because he doesn't have to give us anything but he loves us so much that he does he gives us more than what we need he gives very abundantly but we received grace and apostleship. Apostleship, that's a job title. That was Paul's job title was apostle. He received that from Jesus. Jesus will give us all a job title. To bring about the obedience of faith. So we receive grace And we receive a job title to bring about the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. They're equal. They're parallel with each other. How much obedience do you have? It should be equal to the amount of faith you have. Is our obedience equal to the amount of faith that we claim we have because when we talk to people and we we say you know maybe we're talking about the economy and how inflation's going through the roof and it's getting more and more difficult to buy groceries and all this stuff and folks are just like yeah it's no big deal i I know the lord's got me and all this but then when they get home they're worried oh what are we gonna do we got to figure out our budget. We got to do this. We got to, and they're just worried, 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 worried because their faith isn't where they said it was. We, as Christians, can see where people's faith are based on their obedience to the word. The more obedient someone is, we know just by this one sentence that Paul said that where their faith is. We will also notice know that because when you're obedient to the Lord, you produce the fruits of the Spirit. So not only do we see them being obedient through and with so not say, say, the, the fruits, fruits, of fruits of the Spirit, Spirit, because if they're doing the work of the Lord, they will produce the fruits of the Spirit. Then we know, hey, their faith is this big, or it's this big, or it's immeasurable, depending on how obedient they're being. And then he goes on to say, for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So again, Paul is telling us, we will have a job title of some sort. We will be grafted into the body, and we will have a duty and a function. So our Individual callings are part of a much larger, bigger calling. 
And we can see that in Nehemiah chapter 7. So we will start in verse 5. And I will apologize in advance. I know I will not pronounce all of these names correctly. But I'm going to try my best. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it. These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his house. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramah, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mesopereth, Nehem, Baanah, the number of men of these people of Israel, the sons of Parosh, 2,172, the sons of of Shephatiah, 372, the sons of Arah, 652, the sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 845, the sons of Zechiah, 760, the sons of Benui, 648, the sons of Bebe, 628. The sons of Asgad, 2,322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bebe, 2,067. The Six sons, sons of Aden, 655. The sons of Atur, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashem, 328. The sons of Bezai, 324, the sons of Hareph, 112, the sons of Gibeon, 95, the men of Bethlehem and Netophath, 188, the men of Anathoth, 128, the men of Beth Asmeth, 42, the men of Kiriath Jerem, Chepharah and Beeroth, 743, the men of Ramah and Geba, 621, the men of Michmas, 122, the men of Bethel and Ai, 123, the men of, of the other Nebo, 52, the sons of the other Elam, 1,254, the sons of Harim, 320, the sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721. The sons of Sinai, 3,930. The priests, the sons of Jediah, namely the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emer, 1,052. The sons of Pashur, 1,247. The sons of Harim, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua, namely Cadmiel, of the sons of Hodeva, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ader, the sons of Talon, the sons of Aku, the sons of the sons of Shabbat, 138. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Teboth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Siah, the sons of Padan, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Shammah, the sons of Han, the sons of Dale, the sons of Gehar, the sons of Rhea, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazim, the sons of Uza, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Besai, the sons of Meonim, the sons of Nephishism, the sons of Bakbuk, 
the sons of Hakapha, the sons of Harher, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, and the sons of Nazai, the sons of Hadatha, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophereth, the sons of Perida, the sons of Ja'ala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Potiris Hazabay, the sons of Amon. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Tel Malaha, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adam, and Emmer, but they could not prove their father's house nor their descent whether they belonged to Israel, the sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Also the priests, the sons of Hobiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there, so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Urim and Thummim should arise. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 760, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Now some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, heads of the father's priest garments, and 50 minus of silver. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave into the treasury of the work 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 priest garments. So the priest, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. So I know that was a, a lot to read there. And the overarching part of this passage is the collective calling. We didn't really see that till there towards the end, but we saw the list of people. We saw what all they gave there at the end. And it was saying, the heads of the father's houses. So, the heads of the father's houses felt that burden to give to the work. And to the best of my ability, what all they gave totaled up to somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 million in today's market. Tell me that's not God at work right there. For these people to be brought in out of slavery, most of them, and then to be able to give that much, that's definitely God at work. And a very good picture of the collective calling, the body of Christ working together that he provides supernaturally. Paul gives us a lot more detail on this in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 26. It says, For just as, one body, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, 
Jews and Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would make that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so compassed the body, giving great honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So Paul gets into a lot more detail about collective calling and us all being a part of one body, the body of Christ. He sums it up beautifully there at the end. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. But how often do we do that? How often do we bear one another's burdens? It's easy. It's fun to rejoice when people are happy. And we don't mind doing that. But when folks are hurting, when they've got a huge burden on their shoulders, we tend to just kind of look and like, oh, well, what time is it? Yeah, I got to go. And we don't take the time to do what we should be doing. And that's being united. As it says earlier in this section in Corinthians, there's no division in the body. But yet, we see division all the time. We should be united in everything that we do as Christians. And our calling is just the start of that. Psalm 133 is a really great psalm. It's really short, but it is really good. It says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when the brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. How great it is when we can be unified. How awesome is that? Haggai in the Old Testament is another prophet that was called to do a lot of the work getting Jerusalem and Judah rebuilt. In chapter 1, verse 14, it said, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehazadak, the high priest, and the spirit of of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. They came as one, as a united front to work on the house, to work on the wall, to fulfill their calling, to fulfill the job duty. 
that Jesus had given them. And in 1 Peter 3, 8, it says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Again, unity is listed first. Philippians 2, 2 says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Unity is that, that together you may be. Romans fifteen sixteen, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One voice is unity. Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand. If we can't continue to be unified, if we can't keep that unity under his authority, we will crumble. And just to go back to what we started with, and the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. If unbelievers are that powerful when they unite, how powerful can Christians be when we unite underneath God and His authority? So are we active in the gospel or the church? Are we fulfilling our calling or are we just busy in the gospel or church? And again, I go back to the question that I asked earlier. I haven't heard God. I haven't heard him speak directly to me. The Bible is our first calling. This is a calling for every single one of us. So if we have a burden like Nehemiah had to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, to get up here and preach, to lead worship, whatever it is, that is in addition to God's Word. That is in addition to what He called us to in the Bible. It's not in place of. I can't just simply turn this off and only do this. This is in addition to everything he has called me to do in here. At the end of Matthew, we all know the Great Commission. Go forth and make disciples of all nations. That is a command for all of us to go forth and do that. Not just preachers, not just pastors, not just elders, not just evangelists. Every one of us. I think we forget what it takes to make a disciple. I think we shoot for a convert, and then once we achieve a convert, oh, my part's done. I go home now. But Jesus didn't say make converts. He said make disciples. Disciples, to make a disciple, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes presence. And it takes love. It's hard to do those things when we're not unified. It's hard to do those things when we only see people on Sunday mornings. And I'll leave you with this. Imagine... Just imagine how great of a thing that could be achieved if God's children were actually unified under His authority. Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight. We want to thank you, Lord, for just being here with us. We thank you for the message that you brought to us. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to study your word and and to go through all of this. And we just ask, Lord, that you help us to have open hearts and open minds to what you wanted us to see here tonight. 
And we just ask, Lord, that you help us to implement this in our lives when we leave here. Help us to to go forth and make those disciples as you've called us to do. Because that not only is all of our callings individually, but that's also part of the collective calling that you want us to be a part of. And we just ask, Lord, that you give us that strength and that courage to do that, to talk to people about you and to build your kingdom, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that as we leave here and we go about our lives, that you watch over all of us, protect all of us, and lead us and guide us in your will. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.